You're listening to the Building Psychological Strength Podcast, Professional Edition. My name is April Seifert. Not only am I a doctoral level psychologist, but I've been a successful entrepreneur for a number of years and have learned firsthand that building psychological strength can have a direct impact on your professional success. In this Friday edition of the podcast, I'll offer you tools, tips, tricks, and information to help you become stronger, more resilient, and more successful. Let's get to it. The famous, or maybe infamous, psychologist Philip Zimbardo said, time matters because we are finite, because time is the medium in which we live our lives. Happy Friday, friends. You've made it. It's almost the weekend, and I'm excited that you're here to hang out with me. And I hope that quote gave you a little bit of pause, right? We're finite. The amount of time that we have in a given day is finite. The amount of time that we have in our lives is finite. And the way that we spend that time, who we choose to spend it with, what we choose to spend it doing, ultimately, that is what will make up the context of our life. Our life isn't any anything grander or, you know, bigger than that. It's the sum of the small decisions, the tiny moments, the ways that we choose to spend our time. Our life will ultimately be the sum of all of that. And so when you think about it, making sure that you're intentional and thoughtful about how you spend your time And more importantly, for the purpose of today's episode, this is a professional edition, so let's talk about something related to our professional lives. More importantly, the way that you manage your own calendar, which P.S. dictates so much about how your time ends up playing out, right? The way you manage your calendar will have a huge impact on the way that you experience life. So let me ask it. How's your calendar feeling these days? I kind of giggle because mine's getting a bit out of control. As things slowly start to open up after COVID, we're in this, I don't know, middle sort of gray period where it feels like they're opening up, but uh, maybe there's some stuff out there, but who knows? We're in this period where people are going out more, seeing people more in person, events are popping up, events that have been postponed for a while are popping up. Businesses are revving back up. Things are getting more busy and compacted. And what I'm feeling is that hectic pace slowly starting to creep back in. Or maybe not so slowly for some of you. So I want you to think about that. How is your calendar feeling these days? Because today I'm going to give you five plus a bonus one for the entrepreneurs out there. So six if you're an entrepreneur, five if you're a professional person of any sort. Five hacks to help you manage your calendar. We're doing a little life design today. So hacks that can help you design a better calendar slash time experience. I mean, one of the worst things that I've noticed is, well, it's two things. One, Sometimes the way that we spend our time tends to be very reactive or unintentional. It tends to be dictated by other people, other people's goals, other people's boundaries. We tend to bend to other people and their needs extremely easily. And then the second piece of this, or maybe even just the flip side of the same coin, is that Have you ever had the experience where you look at your calendar and I read this in a book one time and I just love this description. It looks like time confetti. There's just like poof, like little blurbs of time everywhere, but none of them are a chunk that would allow you to do anything meaningful. Or maybe you're in the experience where you're spending a lot of time doing things that uh, aren't moving you closer to your goals, or aren't aligned with your values professionally. If any of that applies to you, today, like I said, I'm going to give you five calendar 
hacks that will help you move in the direction of getting control of your calendar. This isn't going to be an over the overnight thing. This isn't going to clear up every possible thing. But wow, if you can implement just a few of these, I promise you your calendar will be much more under your control and it will be much more of an intentional, sane place to be. And who doesn't want that? All right, so here we go. Let's dive into them. Five slash six hacks to help you gain control of your calendar. Hack number one. This one's going to seem obvious and maybe it's obvious, but the question is, are you doing it? Are you scheduling in your work time? And by that, I mean, don't just write it down. If you're in a job where your calendar is kept electronically, especially if other people have access to your calendar, are you booking work time or are you booking white space in your calendar? Because if you don't, let's think about this. Who's Who has more invested in you achieving your goals or getting your work done than you? Anybody? You think your coworkers care as much about you getting your work done as you do? You think your coworkers care as much? Maybe they care. That's great. People are empathetic. I believe people are good at their core. But do you think they care as much as you do? Do you think they worry as much about that anxiety feeling you feel at the end of the day when you haven't gotten done what you needed to get done and you're trying to figure out how to fit it in before you go to bed? Do they care as much about you feeling that feeling as you do? The answer is certainly no. And if you don't schedule your own work time in on your calendar, especially if you're in a situation where other people can book things on your calendar just at a whim, you will never have, likely, the time you need to complete your work. I'm not saying block off your entire day, and, and I, I need you to be a little bit flexible here. I need you to think about the context of the environment that you're in. Think about your culture at your work. Maybe you can't book giant, you know, four-hour blocks of time, but can you block an hour? Can you block an hour here and there? I would argue, yeah. And if you're saying, no, there's no way that would fly. I can't do it. I can't do it. Try it. Book one hour. Just try it. Book it as a private meeting where you don't allow anybody else to see the details of it. Just try it. See what happens. And if somebody asks, just say, oh, sorry. Yeah, I have something at that time. But can you? And give them an alternate. See what happens. Run this as an experiment. But tip number one, book your work time on your calendar, especially electronically. Number two, if you are, this one is probably more useful for people who are in entrepreneurial setting, but it can also be useful for people who are in more traditional jobs. If you've got, say, a cadence to your week, or let's say you have a strict beginning and an end, or a way in which you like your week to flow, but you find yourself like me, because you want to accommodate other people, because you want to be available and you do, you just genuinely want to help them with the things they need help with and you end up caving and then you're back to time confetti, consider using technology to help you out. There are tools like Dubsado, like Calendly, like Acuity that will help you set rules and set boundaries on your calendar via a set of links that you can send out to people so that they can book on your calendar. Consider thinking about what are those boundaries? What are those rules? In a perfect world, if I set rules and I was going to follow them, what would it look like to create a more sane calendar? Think about that and then use technology to help you implement those rules to basically save you from yourself. Save you from being the person who wants to be there for everyone else and gives and gives and gives but doesn't hold back any time to get their own stuff done. Technology can be a savior. I use these links. I use a tool called Dubsado. I absolutely adore it. I use those links to help me keep my own boundaries because I know I will break them. So that's tip number two. Use technology to help you Set and keep your boundaries, especially if you're the type of person who tends to bend to other people. Okay, third, 
You know when you're going back and forth with somebody, you're going to schedule a meeting, maybe it's a networking thing or something. Uh, and this is a person who doesn't have access to your calendar. So this isn't a coworker. This is typically it happens to me in a networking setting. I'm going to go connect with somebody and we're going to you know talk about what's up in our lives these days. You kind of go back and forth, right? Oh, you know, like, yeah, let's get together and uh, tell, let me know what works for you. And here's some, you know, whatever. And you're kind of going back and forth trying to find a time. Now, this is one of those times where, have you ever heard in negotiation, the person who speaks first, the person who gives a price first is the person who loses? Calendaring is the opposite. Whoever suggests the time first wins because you can look at your calendar sanely without the pressure of anything else and you can find a set of times that work for you based on the boundaries and the flow and the needs that you have and the work time that you need. If at all possible, always, 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 tip number three, always, 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 be the first person to suggest a time or a set of times. This means that you can find a time that's more optimal on your own calendar while still being able to meet with that person, while still giving them a set of options, but you're giving them options within the boundaries of how you have designed your week. So consider being, or don't even consider, just do it always. Be the person who suggests a time first and suggest times that fit within the bounds of that design. Your very well-designed calendar. Your calendar by design. Be the first person to suggest a set of times. And what you might find is nine times out of 10, that person's like, oh yeah, this one works. Because they don't want to have to go through the process of, of the admin of trying to find times. But what they don't realize is how much power is in being the first person to suggest. So make sure you're the first person to suggest available times to meet so that it fits inside your design of your calendar. Number four. Time blocking. Time blocking is where you set aside chunks of time to do certain types of work. And this doesn't have to be like, again, I'm going to set aside four hours where I'm going to work on one project. But maybe, let's say you're the type of person who has one foot in each of two different worlds. Maybe you both, and I was in this position in my corporate career where I was managing a very high performing team and management is its own set of work. It requires strategic thinking and its own sort of brain space. And I also was still doing some individual contributor work, which is a very different mindset. It's a very different way of spending your time when you're doing individual contributor work. What I would try to do, and again, maybe you hit these like 70% of the time or 80% of the time. If the more you can do, the better. So even if you're getting 25% of the way there, that's better than being 100% reactive. But I would try to con- to time block and do more of my management stuff chunked together. And I would do more of my individual contributor stuff chunked together so that I was avoiding something called context switching, where you're going back and forth. And in my case, this is very detailed data work. So I was going down in the weeds and I was digging into data and I was looking for, you know, issues and trends and, and you know, insights and that type of thing. And then I was shooting up to 10,000 feet, trying to be strategic to lead my team. That up and down, up and down, up and down, talk about inefficient. And if you're like most professionals, you probably don't have a whole lot of efficiency to burn. You probably don't have a whole lot of time that you can just poof, let go, right? So as much as possible, think about your activities and how do they chunk together? Are there certain ones that go together and require you to do, to think in a similar way? Maybe there's a bunch of creative stuff you do. Maybe there's a bunch of like learning or synthesis that you do. Maybe there's really detailed data work or spreadsheet work or something like that that you do. Maybe there's more relationship type work. Maybe you're selling or you're networking or whatever. Whatever it happens to be, think about your work and clumping it together so that you're using the same sort of brain juice in order to get it done and try as much as possible to stack that stuff together. This includes meetings too. Maybe you just try to stack a bunch of meetings back to back so that it opens up time later in your week so that you can work on you know other things that are different brain space than what you would do in the meeting. 
But the point is, get creative, think about your own set of responsibilities and tasks, and try as much as you can to time block to avoid context switching. All right, fifth one. It's really interesting when you look at the habit formation and change literature. One of the big pieces of that literature is around triggers or cues. These are things that we encounter that just subconsciously trigger our mind to have the urge to engage in a particular activity. So I'm going to use something completely out of the context of what we're talking about just to make a point and then I'll get us back onto something more relevant. Uh, let's say I had a person in my life who was a, um, a smoker. They smoked a lot. And one cue of theirs was getting in their car. Every time she got in her car, she'd light a cigarette. So contextually, geographically, right, location-wise, when she entered her car, when she was in her car, subconsciously, it triggers our mind to run down a familiar path, meaning the familiar path of having a cigarette, send us a very strong urge to complete that chain. The trigger starts the chain, the cigarette ends it. And so our mind gets super used to the comfort and predictability of these habits, and it sends us these urges to keep us in that comfortable, predictable pattern, even if this stuff isn't good for us, right? Like smoking. So you can use this to your advantage There's all kinds of things, right? Like smoking and eating and like eating unhealthy food and uh, maybe drinking wine and like all these things, right? We can point at all these, you know, habits that maybe we want to reduce or not do as much. But the cool thing about psychology is our mind has a set of processes that it runs on and you can either allow them to do what they are going to do naturally, like necessarily form bad habits or... You can use those processes in your favor. And this is what I'm talking about with this tip number five. One of the strong cues that we have is temporal. It's a a set of cues called temporal cues. In we brush our teeth when? In the morning and before we go to bed. When do you take your vitamins or your medication? We tend to have this internal clock, right, that in general, knows about what time of day it is. And these temporal cues cue off that clock and they cause those urges to do those behaviors at that same time every single day. I think you can probably see where I'm going. If you have certain types of work that are very cyclical, maybe you are in sales and you send a bunch of prospecting emails or whatever the case may be. Um, maybe you are in customer service and you have to send you know, follow-up messages or return calls or whatever the case may be. When you have this repetitive types of uh, work that you need to do, especially, so this works particularly well for repetitive work, do it at the same time every single day slash week. Get yourself to develop a temporal cue around doing that work. You will be shocked at how easy it is to slide into that work when you have your mind forcing that behavioral urge at you at that appropriate time. It's shocking how strong these cues can be and how much you can use them in your favor. So build in routines and habits, develop temporal cues slash triggers, whichever word you want to use, because what you're doing is you're taking advantage of your mind's natural tendency to form habits and to just sort of grease the wheels of getting you into a behavior or in this case, a set of work activities that you want to get done. All right, last one. Number six for entrepreneurs. In, if you own your own business, or even this is for people with a side hustle, right? If you own your own business, there are two main activities that are absolutely critical. You can either work on your business or you can work in your business. Working on your business is a more strategic uh, work. I have past Friday episodes about this. You can go back in the vault and look for those. Um, But you can either work on your business, more strategic work, selling systems, leading a team, building a team, that type of thing. You can work in your business, making the product that you do, delivering the service that you provide, that type of thing. Those are the core activities as an entrepreneur that you should be focusing on. 
What is on your calendar that is not one of those activities? Things like networking. Things like um, maybe more creative endeavors that aren't necessarily bottom line to your business. I'm not telling you not to network. I'm not telling you not to do those things. But what I want you to do is be mindful about how much time you're spending on those other things. Be honest with yourself. Flip through your calendar for the last six to eight weeks and look at it and say, how much of this time am I spending working on or in my business? And how much of that time am I spending doing other things? And give yourself an honest assessment. Do I need to dial some things back? I would network for my job. I love it. I love getting to know other people. But what I noticed is that my instinct to do that will eat up every minute on my calendar if I let it. And this kind of goes back to to tip number two, using technology to help you. I actually have a networking link that saves me from myself. It only allows me to schedule so many networking commitments each week because I know that I'll fill my schedule up because I just think it's fun. And then it'll be at the detriment of the rest of my work. That absolutely needs to happen to keep my business healthy and growing. So that's just a little tip for the entrepreneurs. I'm going to do a quick run through these five slash six tips again, just so that you've got them all in one place. Number one, schedule your work time. Get it on your calendar. Number two, use technology to help you keep and set your own boundaries. Save you from yourself. Number three, always be the first person to suggest a time to meet. Number four, time block and try to avoid context switching. Number five, build in routines and habits. Try to create temporal cues and triggers to help grease the wheels. And number six, for the entrepreneurs out there, limit the time that you are not spending working on or in your business. Limit the time that you're spending working on other things. All right. I super hope that was helpful. Working with my calendar is one of the things that I have really focused a lot on over the past I don't know, three to four years, just making sure that I have good systems and good processes and good design around my calendar. And I cannot describe to you how big of a difference it makes in just how your month, week, day flows. It is, I mean, indescribable. It's incredible. On that note, I'm actually, because I've gotten, I mean, frankly, really good at this, I'm working on a new project right now. This is a calendar-focused project. I know that calendaring and this time confetti issue and trying to manage really complex, high-responsibility lives is something that a lot of us have to do and struggle with, and that's why I'm putting something together to help with that. I'm not ready to announce it yet, but it's going to be coming in the next I don't know, I would say month to eight weeks or so. If you want to be one of the first to know about it, the people who are going to be the first to know about it are the people who are on my individual email list at aprilseifert.com. Not at Peak Mind, but at aprilseifert.com. If you want to be one of the first people who get notified about that, go over to aprilseifert.com, scroll all the way to the bottom, and sign up in the box at the bottom. Drop me your name and your email. I don't really email my list very often. So when you sign up, you're going to get probably a week's worth of just introductory emails like, hey, this is who I am and this is why I care about this work and here's this podcast and here's a talk I've given. You're also going to get just as a bonus, um, you'll get my life design transformation blueprint just as a free gift for signing up. So you'll get that as well. But what ultimately this will buy you is one of the first slots in to a new Uh, resource that I am putting together. So again, if you have issues with your calendar, if you're looking at it and it feels like time confetti, if you're feeling like (laughs) a lot, I've got you. (laughs) I'm there with you. I've got you. And that's why I'm putting this resource together. So sign up at aprilseifert.com. I'll drop that link in this episode description so you can swipe up and get to it. Uh, But yeah, I would love to see you on that list and we'll definitely let that list know about this resource before anybody else gets to know about it. Thank you so much for joining me for this professional edition of the Building Psych Strength podcast. If you're an entrepreneur or a business professional and you're interested in becoming more successful, hit the subscribe button. And until next week, friends, be strong, be resilient, and be successful.